So we'll now begin with reading number 13 of the level 3 curriculum that will tell us how to assist our client in case he has a concentrated single asset position. We'll start by understanding what these positions are, the risks associated with single asset positions, the objectives in managing, the special considerations, a very important process of goal-based decision making, how does asset location and transfer impact the management of a concentrated position and finally understand some steps of managing a concentrated position. So this will be part one of concentrated sing single asset positions and we'll wind it up in the second part in the coming session. So concentrated positions may come from a variety of sources. They could be a result of inheritance, successful entrepreneurship, very successful investments which were a regular or small part of our portfolio many years back but because of their significant outperformance have now occupied or now occupy a large chunk of our overall net worth or of our, or of our overall assets. So these positions often lead to inefficient allocation and may not be generating a fair risk adjusted return as we've studied in the, in the theory of traditional finance and we will repeat it <laughs> and we will repeat, repeat it again that even though one concentrated asset may have the potential for generating high return but it significantly increases the risk of our portfolio and our positions. Illiquidity, tax payouts or tax concerns, legal and emotional issues are some common problems that advisors as well as clients will face in the monetization of these positions. So monetization could be through borrowing, could be through sale, could be through various procedures as we'll see in the coming slides. So a single asset position will continue to have systematic risk, that is the market risk, which will be there in our portfolio otherwise as well, depending on the kind of investments we are taking. However, the bigger problem with single asset positions is that of the high unsystematic risk or diversifiable risk which we continue to carry or which we are not diversifying because we are holding on to this risky single asset position. If we have a high stake in real estate or a high position in real estate, then property specific, location specific risks for real estate also come in. Single asset portfolio at times may have higher expected return as we discussed. However, when downside risk is considered, because the unsystematic risk will also have to be considered as it has not been diversified, the diversified portfolio generally is superior for most investors. So to say at some point in time, we do need to start thinking about how to monetize or sell out this concentrated position and how to diversify the portfolio more so as to enhance the risk return profile of the portfolio. So what are the objectives in managing this position? First, we want to reduce the risk caused by excessive concentration. Many a times we may also need money. So we, we may simply need to sell the asset because we need liquidity for our spending needs. And a very important objective would be to optimize tax efficiency as many a times these concentrated positions would have a very low cost basis. So the asset may now be worth $100 but when we purchased it or when we acquired it, it was $1. So the cost basis is very very low and there will be a huge tax outgo whenever we exercise this or sell out this position. Now. Reducing the concentrated position may not always be appropriate. So just selling it out and getting the cash and investing the cash in other assets may not always be the best way and may not at times be possible also for various reasons. First of all, there may be restrictions on sale. That is, executives who have received stock in compensation may have a requirement to hold on for a minimum period of time, for example. There may be a desire for control. So the investor may want to continue holding a majority shareholding in a particular company. He doesn't want to reduce that even though in his personal net worth it becomes a concentrated position but he's still unwilling to give up control 
because he wants to have a controlling stake and manage the company. Investor may not want to diversify if he is confident that this investment is the best there is or this investment is going to give him the best possible returns in the future. Hence, he wants to create wealth and even though he would like to diversify, but he does not want to sell out this position in order to diversify. So he continues to or he wants to continue to hold on to this concentrated position. The asset may have other uses. For example, if it is real estate, then it could be a key asset used in the business of the owner or the owner may be living there or some of his relatives may be living there and hence he's unwilling to or is unable to sell the asset at the moment. The special considerations that come in, as we saw a large capital gains tax liability that has to be considered. Illiquidity and high transaction costs if we try to liquidate the position too quickly. And thirdly, there may be institutional and capital market constraints that restrict our ability to monetize or sell off this asset. So margin lending rules limit the percentage of the assets value that can be borrowed. So an easy way to monetize without selling is to simply go to a bank, leave this asset as collateral. So you still retain the upside and just borrow against the asset. However, that borrowing will normally be a much smaller percentage of the total value of the asset because of the rules that exist in the marketplace. Securities regulations may define the owner as an insider and hence impose restrictions, regulations and reporting requirements on the position and hence sale may not be that easy. You may need to go through a lot of permissions etc. before you sell out. Contractual restrictions and employer mandates can also impose restrictions. So minimum holding periods or blackout periods when sales may not be made if the company is going through a merger or an acquisition, a CEO may not be allowed to trade on the stock. And otherwise also if the stock has been given there may be a minimum five year six year holding period requirement over and above those of securities laws and regulations so again all these considerations have to be kept in mind before you decide what to do with a concentrated position how you diversify it or sell it finally if there isn't sufficient price history and liquidity then monetization or monetization techniques may simply be unavailable. So if there is no listed stock price, a bank may not lend at all or you may not be able to sell at all. So capital market limitations, liquidity, etc. also have to be kept in mind while managing these positions. Now these positions definitely come along with a lot of biases. People end up holding these positions because of some biases and these biases also have to be accommodated or mitigated when managing the positions. The general cognitive biases that we have seen include conservatism. That is, they want to continue with their existing beliefs. They discard or undermine new information and hence are unable to reconstruct their view or adjust their view. Confirmation is also seen wherein investors seek support for what is already believed and again try to discard information that is otherwise or that refutes their <coughs> opinions. Illusion of control when the investor believes that he can control what will happen to the investment. Remember, illusion of control is a cognitive bias. Overconfidence is an emotional bias. That is also seen and we'll see that in the emotional biases that are association or that are associated with concentrated positions. So cognitive, remember, conservatism, confirmation, illusion of control, anchoring and adjustment in making decisions in reference to the current position held. So we are too anchored to our current target price and our current expectations from this position and hence we do not incorporate the new information fully so as to revise our expectations and at that time that may also be detrimental. Some holders have also been seen to suffer from availability bias in making decisions that is, they make decisions based on how easily it can be recalled and how well they associate with that information. So once again, the cognitive biases of conservatism, confirmation, illusion of control, anchoring and adjustment and availability are seen to accompany concentrated positions. 
The emotional biases include overconfidence as the investor probably controls the asset and he feels that the prospects are good and because he's managing the company so well, the outcomes and the returns will also be good in the near future. Familiarity and illusion of knowledge aid overconfidence and are other emotional biases that lead the investor to overestimate the probability that the investment will produce favorable returns. So he knows all about his company and hence he thinks that it will perform better or he has a better knowledge of this company and hence the returns of this company will be better. There is a status quo bias that is you simply fail to make changes or reevaluate your positions out of laziness or out of just no compulsion to do anything. Naive extrapolation of past results into the future also makes us stick on to the concentrated position without diversifying. Endowment bias is very prevalent. That is, you expect a higher price than what you would be willing to buy the asset for. So you are expecting to be able to sell the asset for more than you yourself would pay for buying it today and hence you are never able to sell it. Or because of endowment, you keep on holding to it even after you realize that you should diversify or you should reduce the concentrated position. Finally, we've seen some amount of loyalty bias as well. That is, you want to retain the employer's stock or a feeling of obligation to retain an inherited position because if your father has donated something or your mother has donated something to you, you're just psychologically attached to it and you don't want to sell it. So there is some degree of loyalty bias with concentrated positions and these inherited assets or employer's stock. So overconfidence, familiarity, illusion of knowledge, status quo, naive extrapolation, endowment and loyalty bias are some psychological bi rather emotional biases that we have seen. Very important, it may be asked in the exam list two cognitive biases and two emotional biases that are seen with concentrated positions or that are generally seen to accompany concentrated positions and you, hence you must try to remember a few of these points at least. Now, to manage concentrated positions, what we can adopt is a process of goal-based decision-making. So what this process says is that an investor's portfolio should be divided into tiers of a, primitive, or of a pyramid. That is, it should be divided into various risk buckets with each tier or each bucket designed to meet progressive levels of client goals. The first bucket, so th this is the total portfolio in dollar amount that we are now going to segregate into buckets. The first bucket we will call the personal risk bucket. A slide is very important. Make sure you understand this concept very well. Numericals may come from this and some item set based and even uh, asset type question is likely to come from these two slides and these concepts that we'll study. So we are tiering the investor's portfolio. The first tier or the first bucket we call as the personal risk bucket. This bucket is to protect the client from poverty. It's not to maintain his lifestyle. It's just to make sure survival. But this is the minimum assets needed without which the client won't be able to survive also or he won't be able to or for basic essential human needs also he won't have money. So this is the risk bucket to protect the client from poverty or a drastic decline in his current lifestyle. So at least this much money we generally try to keep in low risk assets or should be kept in low risk instruments like money market instruments, personal residence are all a part of this bucket. So this much money or this much assets are needed for minimum sustenance of life or to protect the client from poverty. The next category of assets or the next tiering of assets or the next bucket of assets are the market risk bucket. The objective of this bucket is to maintain the client's existing standard of living. So the returns generated from here would be sold or consumed to maintain our current standard of living 
portfolio assets in this bucket would be allocated to stocks and bonds earning an expected market return based on the risk tolerance and the return objectives as we saw in the individual investor section or the IPS construction. The third bucket, if any assets are left after meeting the requirements of the personal risk bucket and the market risk bucket would be a part of the aspirational risk bucket which will hold positions like private business, concentrated stock holdings that we are trying to manage in this review, real estate investments and other riskier positions. Please note real estate investments over and above the personal residence. The personal residence is a part of the personal risk bucket. Market risk bucket in stocks and bonds to maintain correct lifestyle. And then aspirational risk bucket. If successful, these high risk investments could substantially improve the client's standard of living. And in the worst case, even if these investments all become nil, the client's standard of living per se is not impacted. So the personal risk bucket and the market risk bucket together will be able to sustain the client's current lifestyle and the aspirational risk bucket hopes through riskier investments to achieve a much higher standard of living or lifestyle. Even if this investments do not yield a very high return or make losses, the standard of living should not get impacted. The manager and the client must together determine the primary capital necessary to meet the goals of the first two risk buckets. So very important definition now. Primary capital is the capital needed to meet the personal risk bucket and the market risk bucket. That is from poverty and to maintain current lifestyle. And hence, we will be able to derive the surplus capital to meet aspirational goals. Surplus capital would be total capital minus the primary capital. If a concentrated holding in the aspirational bucket leaves insufficient funds for the first two primary capital buckets, then we would conclude that a sale or monetization of the concentrated position must be discussed with the client. So let's say we had a total worth of hundred dollars of this hundred dollars 90 was in real estate or in one big building that I owned and ten dollars was my other assets I decide that my primary capital is twenty dollars that is to protect me from poverty and to maintain my current lifestyle I at least need a portfolio value of twenty dollars such that the interest of this twenty dollars I can use to maintain my current lifestyle at the moment is my primary capital sufficient or, or do I have sufficient capital to meet the in the personal risk bucket and the market risk bucket no because 90 dollars of my hundred dollars will be in the aspirational risk bucket concentrated asset positions real estate investments are all a part of aspirational bucket Hence, I need to transfer some amount from my aspirational bucket into the personal bucket and the market risk bucket. Hence, can we conclude that the sale of this real estate is now necessary or some form of monetization of this concentrated asset position is necessary. So if the client is independently wealthy or is significantly wealthy such that his lifestyle is not impacted, then even if he continues to maintain a concentrated position, we won't be bothered so much. But if his primary capital or that is if his personal risk bucket and market risk buffet, uh, bucket are not sufficient, then definitely we will conclude that now is the time to monetize the concentrated position because if this concentrated position sees a big decline, then the client's standard of living may come under question. So some other questions to address alongside answering this question or deciding how much should be monetized is what are the client's lifestyle spending needs and desires that will all help you determine how much of this concentrated position should you monetize. What is the present value of these needs and desires? What is the value of the concentrated position and do different approaches to sale or monetize this concentrated position produce different values and different results? If then, then we'll have to make a choice again amongst the different methods and pick the best one. 
What other assets does the client have and how liquid are these other assets? Would sale or monetization of the concentrated position be sufficient to fund any shortfall in the primary capital? And if not, then you'll have to see what else may need to be done. Richard Watson is the founder and owner of Berkshire Incorporated, a private company dealing in the business of textiles. Starting from scratch with his unwavering passion and strong determination, he has successfully created an empire worth 70 million euro. His cost basis is near zero. He plans to retire in the next two years and wants to hand over this business to Albert, his son-in-law. Albert is a software engineer working in an MNC for the past 26 years and has no deep insight or interest in his father-in-law's business. His grandchildren, James and Henry, have recently completed their MBA and have joined him. Apart from the business, he owns the following assets. So we'll see this. Let's first take a look at the question. Determine the holdings and the value of his three risk buckets. So now while we are reading these points, we should also try and classify them into one risk bucket or the other. A mortgage free home worth Euro 25 million at Milan. This will be a part of the personal risk bucket. Please note the primary residence is a part of the personal risk bucket. Cash and liquid investments are also part of the personal risk bucket. Short term government bonds worth Euro 700,000 would be a part of the market risk bucket. So these are the general stock, the portfolio that will maintain his current standard of living. Bank certificates of deposits worth $200,000. So they'll be a part of the personal risk bucket. Stock and bond portfolio valued at $2.1 million will be a part of the market risk bucket. Now since the stock and bond portfolio is given to us, short term government bonds can be included as a part of the personal risk bucket because first of all there are government bonds, hence there are risk free securities and then they are short term also in the nature. So again, the personal risk bucket is what can be used to protect the client from poverty. That is these assets is the bare minimum he should always have come what may. So these should be highly risk free liquid securities that should be able to support him in poverty. So even short term government bonds can be considered to be nearly risk free and not much duration. Hence, we can put them in a, as a, a part of the personal risk bucket. He owns land and building valued at Euro 8 million mortgaged for Euro 3 million. The building being used for conducting his business operations. So 8 million minus 3 million that is 5 million is what his concentrated position is in his land and building. This will be a part of the aspirational bucket. So determine the holdings in three buckets. We will say the personal risk bucket would be worth 25 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.7 plus 0 0.2 that is equal to 26 million dollars. The market risk bucket is the 2.1 million stock and bond portfolio. And the aspirational risk bucket as we can see is not 8 million. It is 8 million with a mortgage of 3 million. That is the current value of the asset would be 8 minus 3 that is 5 million. So this is the value in the three buckets.